All right, Parsha 101, Parsha Svayishlach. This week's Torah portion is Parsha Svayishlach, and it's called Vayishlach, which means and he sent, because the first verse of the Torah portion is Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanov, that Yaakov sent messengers before him. Actually, interesting, some of the commentaries say the word Malachim, which we translate as messengers, is that he might have sent, is the same word as like Malach, which is an angel. So that he might have actually sent actual angels before him. And who is he sending them to? He's sending them to his brother, his twin brother Esau. Esau. Because if you remember the end of last week's Torah portion, Yaakov was finally leaving. Yaakov Jacob is finally leaving from his father-in-law Lavan's house. He had to sneak away and then to chase after him and make peace with each other and find out he's finally, finally, finally returning home after all the years. He originally ran away when he was 63. And then he had to work seven years, and he worked seven years, and there were six years going back and forth over the wages. And now he's finally going home, and he finds out that his brother Esau, Esau might still be a little bit upset about those blessings that he took from him. And so he's coming at him with 400 men. So he sent the messengers to kind of feel out the situation and see what's going on. They're like, yeah, Esau's still upset. <laughs> kind of. We get the feeling he, this sense he might still be upset. But part of the message that Yaakov sends Tesa, you know, I'm coming back, and etc, etc. And one of the, the the things that he says that, you know, I lived with Lavan, the word that he uses is Garti, and with Garti, and that Rashi comments, Ra Rashi is one of the foremost commentators, comments that the word Garti, you can actually rearrange the letters, and you get Tuf Resh Yud Gimel, which is the numerical equivalent of 613. That even though I lived with Lavan, and I kept the 613 mitzvahs, the 630 commandments says, and I kept the Torah even living with love on it. He's basically laying out the field for him. Now, even when he finds out that Esav is coming at him with 400 men, he does three things. One is that he prepares for battle. So he divided all his peoples, all of his, his, his family members, his wives and children and mate and servants and everything. He divides it into two camps. So he figures if Esav will attack one camp, the other camp has time to get away, retaliate. The second thing he does is he um, takes time for, for prayer. And the third thing he does is that he prepares a gift, like a bribe of jewels and animals. And he says, actually pace them out so it looks like there's going to be a long line of things, right? Don't bring everything at the same time, kind of pace them out. Another thing he does is he actually hides his daughter, Dina. Um, we know Leah had, Leah had six sons. And then when she was pregnant with the seventh child, who she suspected might be a boy, she prayed that it should be a girl. So that way, her sister Rachel, Rachel, would, would have two sons at least be on par with the other wives. And that daughter is Dina. Dina was, was beautiful, also a, a, a special person. And Yaakov hid Dina because he didn't. He thought, oh, Esau's going to see her. She, he's going to want to take her. And it, it was actually a mistake that he made because he, he didn't anticipate or allow for the fact that because Dina is so special, maybe she could have brought Esau around to repentance. And then... We have a whole story that happens with Dina later on in this week's Parsha. So, etc., etc. He does these things. Now, that night, there's a whole thing that he has to cross over, you know, on the way, and it's splitting up the camp, but he has to cross over a river, right? And then he went back. He realized that he left some things on the other side of the river. He has to go back for them. When he goes back to this, the other side of the river, he encounters, there's a man, right, that he encounters who's, it was actually Esau's, Esau's guardian angel in the shape of a man. We were taken on the form of a man. And they wrestle with each other, and um and Yaakov wins obviously now one thing that he did the angel is that he actually um injured and capacitated Yaakov um he dislocated his hip and there's actually a part of of these days is a part of an animal called a gitanasha it's like in that area that we still don't eat because of what happened so even though it's 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 not a not kosher part of the animal we, we still don't eat it um because it's all it's tied into that so fun fact now, when, even though he wrestled him and, and, and he won, and then he held on to him, he wasn't going to let him go. He wanted to, him to acknowledge the blessings. He wanted to know who he was, you know, all this sort of stuff. But the angel wanted to, he said, let me go. It's dawn now. What does dawn have to do anything? It was time for him to go sing praises to God up in heaven. So he's like, I'm not letting you go until. So that is when the angel said, um, he, he, he gives him a blessing. So he acknowledges that the blessings are yours, right? The blessing that you took, this is the acknowledgement that he gets, these are your blessings. And he, and he also, this is when he changes uh, his name, that 
that he gives him the name Yisrael, right? That were called Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel. This is where the name comes from. Kisarisa, that you that you wrestled, that you fought with, you know, man, God, and you won. And part, part of the thing also is that, again, the commentaries say that this whole wrestling, you know, fighting situation was not just about, you know, Yaakov versus, versus Asa, but it was also indicative of like the spiritual battle between both sides. Um, Yaakov falling in the way of God, um, and doing the right thing and that sort of stuff versus like a more materialistic, I guess you could say, uh, viewpoint. Now, finally, he meets that that's all over and he's actually limping after that. Um, and the next day he finally meets Asa. Um, and this whole thing about when the family comes forward and the, the words they exchange with each other. By the end of it all, Asa acknowledges the birthright that, that it's that it's Yaakov's birthright and he has the blessings. Um, he also says like, oh, why'd you send me all this stuff? Um, I have more, I have so much, I have more than I need, which just shows the type of language that Asa used and Yaakov, the language he used, he says, God has been kind to me that he has all, all that I need, right? That I have all that I need. He spoke more from a place of humility instead of like the more arrogant tone that Asa used of like, oh, look at how much I have, I have so much. Um, but then they part also, Asa's like, oh, let me walk you back. You know, let's go together. Let's go home together. And Yaakov says, no, no, I'm traveling with so much. I'll just slow you down. You go on ahead. Right, even though they they sort of had their peace moment, he still didn't fully trust him. Now, when they do meet, there's a word which you can all look up, and it's in uh, chapter thirty, book of Genesis, chapter thirty-three, verse four. And the word in Hebrew is, is Vayshake that he kissed him. And if you look at the top of it, on top of that word, there's like five dots on top of that word, which is one. It's a very very rare thing to see in the Torah. These five distinct dots on top of the word. So some of the commentaries say, you know, what's going on here? So some say, oh, because Asa usually hated Yaakov. And in that moment, he was kind of overcome with brotherly love. And, and you know, when he hugged him and embraced him, he truly meant it. Another commentary say, no, just because he was hugging and embracing him, don't be fooled. Asa is always going to hate Yaakov. As in Asa of his descendants, they're always going to have it out for them. And Asa of his descendants, we're talking about Asa of his Edom, that's Rome. That's Amalek, who are long, long time enemies. We have many, many stories, many, many stories to come about them the things they did against the Jewish people. So this this is actually this is what they see in those five dots over that word. Now, after this happens, so Yaakov, they part ways and they go on ahead. Yaakov then settles in the area of Shechem. Um, it's actually interesting. He bought the area kind of that he was in. And there's three times, there's three locations in the Torah where where our ancestors bought the land. And those three places are some of the most um fought over places so you have this area of Shechem this is where Joseph is buried in Shechem which I don't think Jews can even like go there these days you have Mars HaMachpela that Avraham Abraham paid for it and full he fully paid for it he wouldn't even take a discount for it and you know the side where Isaac is buried Jewish people are not allowed there there's only certain times a year they open it up to us and then King David bought the area Jerusalem the Temple Mount which you know, we all know what's going on there so it's interesting that those three places we actually have documented that we bought those places. Um, now, what happens there while they're there? His daughter Dina, she went out to go see the people, etc., and she is she's taken by Shem, who's the city was. You know, he, he shares the name of the city. He was he was a son of a great chieftain there, and um, it says that he raped her and he violated her. So, like in a like like a natural way and unnatural way. Um, obviously very terrible situation and when Yaakov found out about it that he's convincing her like oh I want to marry you like I'm so in love with you I'm gonna marry you you know make a whole big peace treaty between my family your family etc so then when they went to go his, he convinced his father to go you know make this offer to to Jacob to Yaakov for the daughter um, um, Yaakov didn't immediately respond now when the brothers found out about it they were very upset, obviously, about what had happened. Specifically, Shimon and Levi were were very specifically upset about it. Now, it wasn't just you have the one part of what they did to their to their sister, which right, that's one element of it. And the second thing is that from after the flood, there were certain moral boundaries that the people had created to say, let's let's never cross these so that we don't go there again. And one of the things, one of the things that they had agreed upon was was rape because before the flood, you know, the whole world was in chaos and people did whatever they wanted to each other. And when they said like, okay, we have to be more careful in this, right? We don't want the world to be destroyed again. So it wasn't just, there was the one thing that they had done, you know, you had stolen the daughter and you had done this to her. 
but it wasn't so it wasn't just a personal front it was actually like the general law of society in those days that they had violated that he had transgressed and Shimon later the brothers in general they didn't just hold Shem accountable for it they held the entire city accountable for it because they said oh y'all stood by right you didn't stop it you didn't interfere so all of you are guilty you're all guilty of having transgressed this societal law and because of what happened to our sister so when Shem's father his name is Hamor Hamor means a donkey in Hebrew so I don't know <laughs> there's no details about why that's his name so when Shem's father came and made the offer to, to Jacob they said they, the brothers came up with this whole thing and they said look we can't just marry into anybody's family you all have to be circumcised and then and then and then we could you know well, well you know our families will unite and we'll, daughters and sons will marry each other and we'll trade with each other and all this sort of stuff so whatever they went and convinced the people of the city like this is what we got to do it's gonna be very beneficial for us to join in with the Jacobson family you know etc etc so they did that and Shimon and Levi, who they were teenagers then, they weren't, they call it, they, they were men, but they were, they were teenagers. They took it upon themselves on the third day when they were all recovering. All the men got circumcised on the third day when they were at their weakest. They went and they, they wiped out the city. The, um, they wiped out all the, they, 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 they killed all the men. And it's, it's interesting. Yaakov was very, he, he was upset at them, but he, he wasn't ex upset at, at the, we'll call it justice. He wasn't upset at the justice that they had done. He wasn't saying like, oh, you never, like this is not the way we behave if someone does this to your sister he was upset that they had that they had gone and taken matters into their own hands right they didn't discuss it with him first and he said now you know we're gonna get a lot of trouble from the neighboring tribe you know the, all the people we're gonna have a lot of trouble from all the people here and this is not the way to go about things right we should have had a court we should have brought them up on trial but it wasn't but again it was it was more about the way they had gone about doing things and not the actual uh, punishment i guess you could say that they meted out and even later on, before he passes away, he cursed their anger and not necessarily the action that they had done. Um, but even so, even so, there actually was not retaliation against them. And, but at that point also, God came to Jake, to Yaakov and he said, you know, stop, stop, um, stop delaying your return home. You got to get, you know, keep moving, keep moving, stop, you know, you got to keep moving. Just get out of here and, and get yourself home. Um, at that time, he actually found out that it, it, it describes that um, this woman, Devorah, who was the wet nurse of Rivka. So Rebecca, his mother's wet nurse, he found out that she, that she passed away. And it says that that's actually telling us also that was Rebecca had, had passed away during that time. So he's on his way home and he, he wasn't there when his mother passed away. He was still on his way home. Um, then also God confirms that Yisrael is going to be your name. And it's interesting because unlike Abraham also got a name change. He went from Avram to Avraham. So Avram to Avram. But he was told your name is never is not going to be Avram anymore. You're always going to be Avram. Yaakov, for Jacob, it was different. He was told your name is now Yaakov and Yisrael also. And it's interchange. But either name can be used. Um, so it's just, it, just to draw a parallel, it's interesting what happened there. And now just to wrap up. Uh, before we get a little too long here um after this now they're on their way home and Binyamin is born which is the loss of the 12 tribes Benjamin is born and Rachel um lives long enough to name him she calls him Ben Oni which is the son of my pain and Yaakov changes it to Binyamin right the son of my right hand he gives a, a little bit of a better name and she passes away they're at they're at base Lechem, which is Bethlehem that's where they're at now and um they actually are not that far from Hebron and, and Maras HaMachpelah Theoretically, technically, Rachel could have been buried in the Mara Samachpela, where the forefathers are all buried. Um, but she was she was born she was buried on the side of their own road in Beis Lechem, in Bethlehem. And God confirmed that this is how it should be, because just to take an extra minute on this, because in the future, at the after the destruction of the of the first um, Beis Hamikdash, the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish people are being led away and chained into exile, and they were brought past on the way they brought past the burial site of 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 Rachel of Rachel's burial site and obviously they cry out to her and they pray there and what's going on up in heaven is that you know everybody found out what was going on obviously down below so you had the forefathers that come before God and say you know you know have mercy on on the Jewish people don't let this happen etc 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 and you had Moses go up and all these people are pleading the case and God God was not accepting the the plea they made and finally you know, the children cried to, to our, we call her mother Rachel, and Rachel goes before God and she says, remember I had, you know, I was about to marry Jacob and I gave up, I gave that up for Leah. I, I told her the sign so she wouldn't be embarrassed. Um, 
and for her, she didn't know that she was that she would still marry Jacob at that point. She had given up her life for that. She had mercy on her sister to not be embarrassed in front of everyone. But you know, she wouldn't know the signs, and and Jacob would make a whole big deal about it. So she says to God, "Can it, can it be possible that that the mercy you know of a human being can be greater than your mercy? You know, the Creator of the universe." And God listened to that, and He says, "Rachel, in your marriage, your your children will be returned to their land." Which, if you just think about it for a moment, it's it obviously highlights the greatness of what of what Rachel did but if you want to take it on a broader uh just thought of it it's just imagine just the the let me say the internal the eternality the eternal effects that uh, that that a good deed can have maybe we don't necessarily have the opportunity of doing such a something so grand and so great as a sacrifice that Rachel made um but even just one good deed Think of how far-reaching and how long it lasts. It's, it's eternal, and and the and the reverberations from it, the effects of it, are last forever. We don't we don't even know. We can't even know. But here we see an actual um, real thing. And then actually, the parsha wraps up. It actually speaks about Yitzchak's passing, of Isaac's passing, which happened when he was 180 years old. Um, even though it didn't happen yet, right within the storyline. But in a way, it's telling us that we're wrapping up kind of Isaac's part in the story now of the Jewish people. Um, because we don't have, we don't see more stories about him going forward. It's going to be more focused on the twelve tribes, Jacob, the twelve tribes, etc. And it also wraps up um, with um, Asaph's line and all his Asaph descendants, because um, it's just showing us that he too had grown into a great nation. But we don't want to spend too much time on him because he's not really the focus of the Torah. <laughs> so that's where the the Torah portion ends off with those things. Um, and that's and that's this week's uh, tour portion.